Welcome back once again, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you guys for joining us here tonight on the Wisconsin Conservative Conversations. Um, we didn't have an episode last week. Well, we kind of did, but it was focused more around the primary. So we were doing a primary breakdown and everything, but we haven't had a guest in a couple of weeks. And a lot of that was because we were leading up to the primaries. Uh, we finished that off and we're going to talk more about that on our Tuesday night show uh, later on tonight. But tonight, we're going to be speaking with a special guest and uh, tell you this gentleman, great guy. I've had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times. Uh, and what I want to bring across here as we go through this particular episode is the role of the Republican Party of Wisconsin. It is my belief and one that I've had before the perception and one that I see a lot of other people having is the role of the Republican Party of Wisconsin. So tonight, our special guest is going to be the chairman of the Republican Party of Wisconsin, Mr. Paul Farrell. Let's welcome him on board here. Paul, how are you, sir? Ed, I'm doing great. It's a great evening here in Wisconsin. It is absolutely amazing, although I do have to ask a question, and this is probably beyond the responsibilities of the Republican Party, but did, did spring just kind of, or summer, did it just kind of leave us all of a sudden? <laughs> you know, as I always say, it's August in Wisconsin. You're going to go from 90 degree weather down to 40 degree weather. And as an avid fisherman, I get at the end of the month, there's a musky tournament that I'm always part of. And it's amazing because we never know what the weather is going to be like. We literally have had sleep in some years and other years. I mean, the guys are stripping down their, their T-shirts down to their swimsuit, jumping in the lake instead of fishing because it's 95 degrees. Well, you know, it's Wisconsin. It's Wisconsin, and really, you know, I've had the privilege of living in many different states, but I know Wisconsin in particular. We tend to have three perfect days in the year, and one of those perfect days, we know it's sometime during the two weeks of Summerfest, mm -hmm. but the problem is, as Wisconsinites, we can't really, we can agree on what to drink, and we can agree on what sports we want. We just can't agree on what those three perfect days are. It's always, someone always has a different opinion, and uh, yeah, it's actually pretty yeah. funny. And there's always one good day in state fair. This is true. That run. Those two you can count on. The rest of them, good luck. You just don't know which day it is yeah. in that time period. But that's Wisconsin for you. And speaking of Wisconsin, this is home. And being home, we want to make sure that we're protecting it. We want to be the safeguard and in, enshrining our, our freedom, our liberty. And that's where I think this 2022 primary this 2022 general elections really coming down to yourself you're the chairman of the republican party of wisconsin no stranger to state politics you've been a, a state assemblyman state senator you're currently also the uh waukesha county executive is that correct yep that's what it is and then you you because you didn't have enough on your plate you wanted to be the chairman of the Republican Party of Wisconsin. What led you to, to that position there before we go deeper into the meat there? You know, I'll, I'll tell you that the fun side of the story is my lovely wife. We just celebrated 35 years on August 1st. Congratulations. Last, thank you. Last year, she retired as a school counselor, 34 years as a school counselor. And as we all have talked about with education, she kind of saw the writing on the wall and said, you know what, I've had enough. It's time to move on to an, another phase. And as she was retiring last summer, she said, look, I got a lot of things that I'm going to be doing. So you better find yourself a hobby to keep busy because we're going to be zigzagging all over the place. I'm the type that loves to solve problems, loves to get engaged and get involved. And so I think it was about a month after she told me that I came home and said, honey, I got a great new hobby. I'm the state chairman of the Republican Party. <laughs> and she just kind of looked at me and says, you know, I was looking more woodworking than this. But politics has been near and dear to my heart for a long time. You know, yes. when I think back, uh, we grew up in Wisconsin. I have four brothers. And my mom actually started off in local politics in 1976. I was 11 years old at the time. And she was a village trustee in the village of Elm Grove, worked her way up to village president. Mid 80s, she ran for the state assembly against a sitting incumbent and beat him and never looked back. You know, she went on to the state Senate. She was on the Joint Finance Committee. She was assistant majority leader. 
And then she, in 2000, when Tommy Thompson left the state to go out to D.C. as the HHS secretary, Scott McCallum, who was lieutenant governor, was then placed as governor. And he appointed mom the first female lieutenant governor in the state of Wisconsin. So back in 2000, mom took the oath. She was the lieutenant governor for two years. Unfortunately, they lost in 2002. And for us, it was one of those, okay, is somebody going to follow our politics? Nah. I had my own business. I had a small home inspection company, a radon mitigation companies that I was running. But 2010, I got the bug and jumped in. The reason I put all that out there is because mom and dad taught us to be servers, to be servants, and to, to give our time, give our energy, give where we can. And so last year, when then Andrew Hitt, who was the chairman, asked me to come on board as finance chair, and we started talking, he said, look, Paul, I've got so little kids, I got my boys are in their teens, you know, tens and below. My two boys are, are grown and out of the house at 28 and 24. We're in different parts of our life. And he says, we need someone who can step in and really kind of lead us in a new direction. And there's a lot of turmoil and I need a steadying voice and a steadying force. Right. And so I talked to my wife about it and said, I, this is what I'm supposed to do right now. I know it. I know this is the path that I'm supposed to be on. I enjoy what I am. I love being a Republican. And I want us to get back to what a Republican organization was, that grassroots organization that I was part of. I was an executive committee member of the Waukesha County Republican Party back in the early 2000s, volunteered on I don't know how many different campaigns and helped out from lit drops to door knocking to dropping signs and really wanted us to get back to our grassroots, get back to the people. And that's what I've spent the last year doing. I think we've come a long way getting back to our roots, re-energizing our base. And it's been a it's been a heck of an interesting run. And I think in November 8th, we're going to show a victorious time and have a new Republican governor. It's definitely been interesting this past year. And for myself as... <sighs> I don't think I, I, there's nothing really special about me. And I always say that because I'm just, I'm a dude in the middle of central Wisconsin. I live in a very rural area. I have the recording studio in my basement and I've had the privilege of seeing behind the curtain. And it, it's interesting watching the, the dynamics of everything play out, watching, you know, the players back and forth, people running in these primaries and, I, I find it fascinating because we just came off of a really, really hot, contentious 2020 election. Um, some people, you know, obviously they have, they're upset about it. The outcome was not to their desire. Right. And that, of course, launched a number of groups. Uh, when I look at something like that and all of the issues going on from the federal government, state government, obviously we everybody remembers the summer of love. That was a great time. Mm-hmm. Um, you you kind of came in and really being involved in state politics, I think certainly primed you up, but I mean, it's like you went from the pan right into the fire. Oh yeah. I think I missed the pan. <laughs> and, and it's, and it's one of those where I don't mind because what I heard through all of last year, early part of this year is frustration. You know, and I think what happened was, in 2020, during that election, there were anomalies. There was some huge problems, especially because of that COVID that we were going through, the lockdowns that the governor put on, and everybody kind of threw up their arms and said, oh, my God, we can't do anything because this bug is going to kill us all if we're not careful. Correct. By saying that, they said, you know what? Your rights don't matter anymore. Open elections don't matter anymore. We're going to take advantage of the opportunity and say, Whatever you want to do, go ahead and do it. As long as you put a couple of slashes on a piece of paper and throw it in, we're going to be okay with it. That's a problem. And that's the challenge that we had is to say, you know what, folks, we have a government. The government is supposed to work on behalf of the people and it failed and we need to get it back. And I think when I talk to people about the election and we talk about decertify, we talk about the, the issues that are out there, I don't see it as we have to decertify. I see as we have to make a change, right? We've got to get people to be 
cognizant of what the election system is and understand that we can have fair and open elections. You look at this past spring. We had more people turn out in a spring election cycle without a statewide ballot on the on it or a statewide position than ever before. We flipped school boards. We Correct. flipped county boards. We flipped five county executive seats. We took mayors out. We took municipal boards out. We flipped 800 some seats. 300 of them were truly liberal seats that we took. That's huge. Right. And when I look at it, I, I talked to, to Bill Fian up in La Crosse. When you think about what they did in the county board, they're two away from a majority now on the county board up in La Crosse. Mm -hmm. So La Crosse went out to try to put on the ballot. I believe this is the way it worked. They want to put on the ballot the a referendum that says we should legalize marijuana for the second time. They did it in 2020. Our conservative voices put enough pressure on it. They didn't, didn't get it done. That's how we make a difference. Right. And so when I look at the election process that we're going through right now, this primary was robust. We had over almost 20 candidates, Republican candidates yeah. on the ticket for statewide offices. That's a level of energy we have never seen before. And now as we came a week after that, so we're coalescing around our candidates that won and starting to work with them. I was just in an event this afternoon with Tim Michaels and Senator mm -hmm. Johnson. We're in a great spot to help those county parties really gin up their team, get them going and come out and turn out and be victorious on November 8th. And I think that's that's something really important. And I was reading over an article you had penned. Uh, it was on Wisconsin right now. Uh, it was published uh, in September 21. And that was the, that was the theme of what you had written about was going back to the grassroots. Um, and I think a lot of people don't quite understand because I've seen several different groups try to lay claim like there's some kind of exclusivity to what grassroots is. Um, but at the same time, the grassroots is you, it's me, it's everybody, yeah. you know, that's on the ground knocking doors, advocating. What is the role of RPW, the Republican Party of Wisconsin, in motivating, bringing the message across, talking points, if you will. And I know some people sure. are going to be really cringe about that word, but it's like, well, everybody needs bullet points, so it is what it is. You know, when you think about it, when you think about organizations, there's a number of different ways they're set up. Uh, when I think about the Democratic Party, it's more of a union concept. They work from the top down and they tell their minions what they're supposed to be doing and give them their marching orders. Uh, their executive director is a paid position. He is a fundraiser from out of state that pulled in a whole bunch of out, out of state money and worked their way through. We're a volunteer. I'm, I'm a volunteer chairman. Our board is all volunteers. We have a staff at the party that are paid and their job is to support the county parties. So when you think about it, really, we're not a top down organization. We're a bottom up organization. The party, the county parties say, Paul, this is what we need. This is the support we need, or we need some help over here, or we need some training for our people over in this area. We come in and help them out with that and work through it. But when you think about this last cycle, and I was talking about the spring elections, yes, the state party actually provided about $350,000 of funding that we raised and got it out to the local parties to help those municipal candidates be successful. That's our job. We are kind of about the behind the scenes, helping out where we can, putting the energy in. As we move through the primaries into the general, we help work with the, the top candidates, so our statewide candidates and our U.S. Senate candidate, we're organizing the field teams that are going to be working with the county parties to really help expand the scope of what they can do and reach out. The party really comes down to the individual. Right. And I think it was kind of a, a, an interesting thing that happened. And when you look at this primary, on the Democratic side, Three of the top four candidates dropped out within seven days of the primary. That's yep. You know, you think about that. If we did that on the Republican side, people would be crying, saying the guy, the machine down in Madison told us to get off and they don't want to hear our voice. What we did is say, you know what? Your voice matters. And that's what the whole convention was about. Making sure that people's voices matter, making sure that everybody had an opportunity to say, this is what my concerns are. This is what I want to do. Here's where we need to go. Right. Some of us won, some of us lost, but the cool thing is you can now say, you know what? The party's listening to me. 
So as I move forward, and I think Tim Ramthan did a great job when you look at Saturday night in Dane County. He realized now's the time to support Tim as we move forward. Right. And you heard Rebecca on Tuesday night. She said, now's the time to coalesce behind Tim Michaels as we move forward. That's what we're going to see. Right. He's now the standard bearer for the governor's race. We're going to be able to support him, help him get across that finish line so that we can do the reforms that we want to do to make Wisconsin great again. Right. Uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, during the primaries with uh, Tim Michaels being the the front runner, uh, the front runner, he's obviously the winner. Um, so he, he's the standard bearer. One of the things that we're seeing right now, and I think, I don't know if this is just indicative of coming off a primary, but it seems like there's a need to bend fences. And as I'm watching people, and I probably spend way too much time on social media, which is probably my fault. Uh, not good for your sanity, by the way. But as I look through some of this, and, you, and we have to keep in mind when you go through social media, it makes people very brave. They will oftentimes say things that they will never say to another individual publicly, you know, face to face. But there is this tension how do we as a party mend that so we can say, hey, listen, primary's done. Uh, maybe, you know, there's an apology back and forth. I don't know how we do that, but you know what? Do we really want four more years to Tony Evers? Because that's, that's what we need to look at. Right. You know, I, I, the best analogy that I can come up with, Ed, is, again, I'll talk about my family. I have four brothers. All right. Good Catholic family, John, Bill, Peter, Paul, and Mark. We fought all the time. <laughs> Peter and I are twins, two minutes apart. Yes. And trust me, there was never a dull moment in our household. We would pick on each other. We would, we would fight each other. We would argue. We would scream at each other. But if somebody attacked us from outside, if somebody challenged my brother, we were all there to fight with him. Right. That's where we're at right now. We just had the family go through a primary to say, you know what? Who's the best candidate right now? that we want to support. We're going to fight for that candidate. If they won, great. If they lost, you got to take a couple of days and say, oh my God, how did we lose that fight? Why didn't Correct. we win? What happened? But then all of a sudden, Tony Evers pops his head up and says, you know what? The Republicans don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And we all say, hang on a second. You're a guy that loves plagiarism. You know, as someone who's the education governor, when you signed your name on a budget that the legislature passed, you can't come out and say, look at all the hard work I did just because I signed my name on Correct. it. Correct. If you and I did that in high school, we would have gotten an F. Plagiarism, pure and simple. But that's what Tony's doing. And all of a sudden, we're going to say, wait, you know what? Yep, family first. We got to corral our team together, and we got to go back and fight against what really is the problem the failed leadership that we have in Tony Evers and Mandela Barnes' administration, Josh Call, we know what the issues are going down the list. We got to take them on so that we bring Wisconsin sanity back. Right. And I think the family is going to come back together and do that. And, and I'm really hoping for that because to me, as somebody who, you know, with the mic and everything, and I get the ear of certain people, I'd like to be able to advocate for that because at the end of the day, I always go back to 2020, that summer, Kenosha. I go back to the lockdowns and I have seen, I've seen elderly folks that would just go driving around town during the shutdown and they were driving around bars, hoping to find something. It's not that they were drinking. Yeah. It's just that at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, one o'clock in the afternoon, that was the social hangout. They would go get some lunch, have a soda, and hang out with their friends for that was their socialization that was their outlet and i've seen too many businesses fall under i, I always go back to that and that's just you're right when you think about that and, and you want a great story again from family um even my parents so they've been going to the same restaurant 12 years okay. for lunch every day and we joke about it because the waitresses don't even ask dad what he wants for lunch anymore. They just bring him. <laughs> it's either toast with scrambled eggs or they're going to change it up and have scrambled eggs with toast. I mean, it's hilarious. But during the lockdown, they couldn't see their friends. Right. You know what they did? The owner of the restaurant actually said, all right, you guys, I'm going to meet you at 1130. Come on over. 
and they sat in their car, three cars wide, and three different couples who they would always talk to sat in their cars and had their lunch and cried because they couldn't sit next to each other and talk. Mm -hmm. That's the type of thing, like you said, that changed our society. Right. I think about here, my, my wife was teaching and she was sitting in another room in this house trying to get kids to get engaged while talking on a screen like this. Correct. You know, as the county executive, I we shut down at first. Then we said, no, we're essential. We're going to be back in it three days a week. Even though we were told to go home, I was in my office because I had staff who couldn't leave their job. I had correctional right. officers. They couldn't stay at home. We had other individuals throughout the building that had to be there. And I wanted them to realize I'm going to be there right with them. Right. And that's the responsibility. That's the leadership we were looking for. Instead of running and hiding in your basement and saying, oh, I can't do anything. We need a leader to step up and say enough is enough. Let's get moving on this. Correct. I want to go back to the functionality of RPW as it relates to the county parties. My understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. on this, it's a very decentralized network. And I think your analogy of the Democrat Party here is I, best analogy I've heard in quite some time. Very union like. Yeah. It's we're going to do this. And so will all of you. RPW seems to me, as it relates to the counties and the county parties, very decentralized, very hands off. Is that a correct take on that? Yeah. When you, and you hear a lot that says that we're, we're located in Madison. The reason the party is located in Madison is twofold. One, the building that we own was basically gifted to us. And so we own our own property in Madison. I don't know if it's worth anything because it's Republican Party <laughs> in Madison. But the other issue that it is, is the Republicans that work in the legislature cannot do campaign time in that capital. Mm -hmm. It's against the law. So they need something close by. And the offices is about three blocks away from the Capitol where they can come and they can talk about campaigning. They can make phone calls for fundraisers. They can set those things up and talk about the process of politicking, of going out and running campaigns in a legal setting where they right. can get this done. So we work out of this office in Madison to set this up. The Republican Party has a staff of just under a dozen people right now. We've actually ramped up because of the elections. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, half of my staff actually work in an office in Brookfield because we have Senator Johnson's team out there. We have our team. We have the RNC Victory team is out there. And now Tim Michaels is bringing his team over. So we've got our consolidated team in one location able to make decisions on the fly because we're right there. That's how we operate but then we spread all our energy out. So we partner with the Hispanic outreach in, in Milwaukee, yes. African-American office in, in Milwaukee, bunch of offices across the state that we've opened that we partner with the county parties. We'll pay part of the lease. They'll pay part of the lease so that we can spread our energy across the state. That's how we work. And that's how we'll continue to work. You know, and I think there's a lot of people that have a misunderstanding of what RPW is, and that's something actually I was not aware of. Uh, what you were talking about as it relates to trying to set up offices, who's going to be, you know, responsible for what. And I think it's important to bring that information out to people because I've heard a lot of people over the past, you know, year in particular, well, RPW is supposed to do this. RPW doesn't do that. It's like, do you? actually no i mean have you bothered to talk and ask and i think that's kind of there's there's an art i think that's been lost and unfortunately i think politics seems to bring out some of the worst in some people especially amongst the surrogates and the the lesser informed individual and i readily admit at, at many points i think i was in that category myself but the i like to also pride myself on relationship building talking to folks, asking, and I'm totally okay with being wrong about something. How much have you got that from, from people saying, hey, you know what? Maybe I wasn't right about this. Or people just coming up and just wanting to get a better understanding of what you guys do with the Republican Party of Wisconsin. I think there's a lot of people. And I think you put it right early on when you said you got to look behind the curtain. 
everybody thinks that there's this huge organization that's behind the curtain that is the secret group that's doing all the work and doing all these things and moving all the levers. When in fact, under my tutelage, and I, I learned this from mom and dad, I check my ego at the door. This right. isn't about me. This is about the party. And what I have told my team, if it's if something happens that's negative, I take the blame for it and I listen and I say, we're going to make changes. When we win, the team wins. Right. And when you see it done properly, means you're effective. The candidates are the victorious ones. How we get there, and as we joke about it, you know, you, you see it every day. Doesn't matter how you win or lose. Actually, it doesn't. I said, shouldn't say it that way. Doesn't matter how you win. It matters how you bring your team together to win. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I want to make sure that our team is pushing as hard as they can. We're going to high five it. But at times we're going to step, we're going to misstep. Right. We're going to trip up. We pick each other up and we help out as quickly as we can to learn from our mistakes. There's a great book that I talk about all the time that John Maxwell wrote called Failing Forward. The more that you understand what your failure is and that it's an opportunity to learn and make the next step and keep moving, that's when you become successful. And so we've seen it this year. There's been a lot of missteps. There's been issues that have come up. We listen, we work, we try to solve it and we move forward. I think we've been pretty successful at it. And because of that, our county parties realize, you know what? They got our back. Right. They're going to help us out and they're going to help us keep moving forward. You know, and I had to write down that uh, the book you just mentioned, Failing Forward, because anytime somebody talks about a book, chance are that's going to be my next read i'm always about trying to learn something new um but i think that it is important because it, with the county parties it's it's important to, that they know they have backing from the state but the question i have now when i think about the county parties when i look at the turnout that we had here in this primary last week record turnout from what i'm hearing um some of the highest numbers that we've had in quite some time if that's correct my the question I have here is what can more of the counties do, especially in the rural areas? Because I, I feel like sometimes the rural communities often get taken for granted. And I think some of the county parties just kind of assume, hey, we got 67%, you know, Republican, we're fine. Right. What can the county parties do to reach out to the politically uninitiated? Because I think we oftentimes when we have these GOP events, we have these Patriot Group events, we have whatever conservative events we're going to have oftentimes we're preaching to the choir right and what can we do to advocate outside of our bubble you know i think that some of the parties that are the most successful are inviting people in and then helping them to answer their questions in a very non-intimidating way a lot of people when when they think about politics they see it, see it on TV. We see all the negative ads. Everybody's frustrated over the negativity that's out there. Mm -hmm. But they want to have answers. They want to know what's going on. Those individuals, when you can sit down and start talking to someone and say, here's what my beliefs are. Here's what I do. Here's what I'm looking at. I'm not telling you you have to do this. Right. I'm giving you an option to look at it. When we have those conversations, then we're successful. Mm -hmm. Then we're turning people and we're starting to realize it. And you're seeing it in the, in the Northern party and party counties. You're seeing it kind of in the mid state where the Democrats used to have a pretty solid hold on this state. It's mm -hmm. gone red. Yeah. And it's because the Democrats stopped listening and started telling. And we are the party that really tries to listen to what your concerns are, says, okay, help us find that solution. Solution might be, and I think in this case, the solution is Tim Michaels and the other people that we have. So how do we get them across the finish line so they're going to listen to us and make the changes in government that we want to see? Correct. That's how we work best is when we're actually engaging like that. Well, you mentioned you know, the solution being Tim Michaels, and I think that's a great segue to this and ties together with the county parties because we've seen the successes of the lacrosse, the Eau Claire's. We see the success of, you know, the Stevens Point area, Senator Pat Teston. He happens to be my senator. His story is very well known. Democrats stronghold for the longest time. 
He ends up running. He wins and he runs for re-election and he wins by an even larger margin. Um, when we look at this going into this general, we what, two and a half months, a little more than that. Probably 83 days. It's on my phone. Hang on a sec. Cause now I, got, I bet now you got a countdown out too. On it. I bet you have days. a countdown. I do. I have a countdown clock going here, baby. <laughs> 83 days, 11 hours, and 59 minutes. That's what we got going right now. I'm going to have to put that on my website because uh, I'm slipping over here, so I can't can't have that. That's, that's 7 a.m. on November 8th is when it, the clock stops. Wow. And that's going to be fast. That's going to be a very fast turnaround. Yeah. The solution is electing Tim Michaels, is having Eric Tooney as the attorney general. Amy Laudenbach as our Secretary of State. What's the path forward? You know, right now, it's energy. And we're seeing it. We were just at an event up in Germantown. There was about 100 plus people that were crammed into this little office listening to Senator Johnson and to Tim Michaels talk about how, one, we've got to unify the team, but two, how we're taking their voice to Madison, to D.C., to make a change. And that's what it comes down to. And that's where I saw the grassroots engage, this party engage like it never has before in the spring election cycle. As you said, we saw great numbers coming out of the primary. We know we're going to get a boost in the general, more people will vote. Now is the time to really start rallying people and say, you know what? We're going to make a difference. We have four years of failure. We have saw, seen lack of leadership. We're looking at situations right now. And you, you kind of look at it, county government, we're an arm of the state government. We can't even get social workers because they can't get their licensure through DSPS. Mm -hmm. They were told it's going to be three months. They're six, eight months out. We're failing our workers at the state level. All right. And that's all the leadership under Mandela Barnes and Governor Evers that we've got to get out of there, clean it out. I couldn't think of a better person in a true business mindset to come in and say, okay, enough's enough. We're customer service. Government is a customer service organization that's here to serve the people of Wisconsin. Let's get that back on track and get it done. Well, I'm really glad you mentioned that licensing issue too, because like one of the ones that's always just blown me away is, you know, what is, I think like three months to become an EMT. But yet you got to go to, I think it's a year, year and a half, and then under apprenticeship just to be able to cut hair. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I need somebody to line me up, but I don't think it takes a year and a half to figure it out. You know, yeah. I kind of want that person who's like, you know, doing chest compressions to have more than three months. But I kind of like being alive, too. So there is that. You know, there's other states that are out there that are ahead of us uh, that have said and they call it the trailer bill. When an individual gets transferred into a company, their spouse usually comes with them. Well, yeah. if that spouse has a license in another state, they got to go through a whole bunch of hoops here to get licensed to practice whatever their profession is in Wisconsin. There are other states that said, here's what we're going to do. If you're moving in with your spouse, he's got a job, she's got a job. We're going to allow you to start working under a probationary license. There's a couple of things we need you to work through. You're going to have a couple of months to get that done, but we want you to get started right away. Right. Those are the changes that we want to have because we know we need more people. We know we need more of a workforce. Those are those type of opportunity. I think that are out there that says, here's how we're going to be able to make a difference. The Republicans right. are the ones that are willing to listen to those. Yeah. And I think, you know, Republicans in general, we just tend to be more business minded and, you know, granted, yes, I think everybody, there is a need for social safety net programs. I, and I think as a civilized society, mm -hmm. we certainly do have a fiduciary duty to take care of those that can't take care of themselves. Right. But we also don't want to create a dependent class of people. So I, when you look at those reciprocity agreements for licensing, various things, I mean, yeah, you might have to do your continuing education units. Yeah. But that's just, the price of doing business. Right. But I think in a Republican administration, it becomes that much easier and it helps to offset the brain drain that we have here at the state. And that's when I, when I have the privilege of talking to some of these gubernatorial candidates, Lieutenant governor candidates, that's always one of the questions I ask because I myself have, God, if I told you, I tried to leave the state eight or nine times, I would not be lying. Um, but every time I keep coming back because in the end it's home. Yep. 
I was also a military brat and served myself, but <laughs> you know how that goes. You get shuffled around yes. quite a bit. But um, so I think that that's really, really important because at the end of the day, I think what we're looking at, at least from my perspective, the number one issue is the economy, is it's job creation. It yeah. is and someone like Tim Michaels, I think, would have an inside, you know, unique perspective on that. You know, we, we always talk about government's there to create jobs. Well, government doesn't create jobs. Now, there are 71,000 employees in state government that we got to figure out how to reduce that number. Private sector is the one that creates jobs. So if you want to create an atmosphere in order to increase those opportunities, you need someone who's created the jobs. And we know hearing from Tim and talking to him, when he and his brothers took over from his dad, they had a couple hundred employees. They now have over 8,000. They're the third largest construction company in the country. Wow. That's the type of mindset that you want to say, okay, how do we do this? What do we need from government? And a lot of what do we need to get out of the way of government so that we can get the private sector to be flourishing? Mm -hmm. And we, we've seen it. When you think about Again, as I've said it earlier, the, the two budgets that the governor presented, he presented over $2 billion in tax increases. Right. Both times the Republican legislature held strong, created tax cuts that he signed. We now have a surplus, almost $3 billion, three to $5 billion we're probably going to see at the end of this. That shows that if we give the money back to businesses, back to the people, we're going to be able to see it tenfold come on the other side. Mm -hmm. We're going to see them be able to engage the way we want them to engage to make this a great state. That's how we're going to get this done. But it's not going to happen if we don't have a Republican governor helping us out. When I think, you know, whether we're talking that issue, whether we're talking investigation into 2020, I think a lot of people, you can have all the rallies in the world that you want. You can write all the op-ed pieces that you want. You could be as upset as you want. But none of that matters unless you happen to be running the state. And I think yeah. that becomes the importance of this general election because it I've framed it like this. I, I believe that this race is so incredibly important that whoever wins is going to either let the floodgates open up and federal government is going to do what they're going to do, or they're going to be the vanguard, the bulkhead against an overreaching federal government. And Ron Johnson's position is so incredibly important. Oh, yeah. Where it can literally shift the balance of power. You know, when you think about Wisconsin, and we talk about it being a purple state, it's it's hopefully ticking red a little bit more and more every day. But Ron Johnson is the voice that we need in Madison, or excuse me, in D.C. We need him out there as a stalwart in the Senate so that when we get the majority He's going to be leading the charge and looking into a lot of the challenges that are out there. A lot of the issues, if it goes from the Biden laptop to whatever and what has happened. And, and you saw the divisiveness that's occurred in DOJ looking at only one side of the aisle, not the other. Correct. I know Ron's going to go out there and say, OK, enough's enough. We're looking at all of it. We're trying to figure this whole thing out mm -hmm. and we're going to do it the right way. You look on the lacrosse area and Derek Van Orden in the third. Yes. The, the House has already said this is one of the hinge points. This is an opportunity to sway it one way or the other. We're leading right now. Derek is out there churning it up and making sure that we're going to win that new congressional seat. That puts us at a 5-2 majority in the Congress in, in from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. That type of voice is a strength when you go out to the House, when you go out to the Senate. We can start making some changes and bring how we do things in Wisconsin out to D.C. and get it done. You know, and I'm so glad that you said that. And I, I know your time is extremely precious, so I do truly value that. But you mentioned something here, and I would be I would be negligent if I didn't bring that up. Did you ever think Wisconsin would become the tip of the spear when it comes to state politics? You know, I look back, and I came into the legislature in 2010, so into the 2011 session with, with Governor Walker, uh, I was one of the 27 freshmen that came in in the Tea Party movement mm -hmm. and was there for Act 10, was there. And I think that is the one, if you had to look back through politics, that one moment in time was the Tea Party movement yep. after the Democrats took everything in 2009 uh, and, and ran up the, the, the taxes, ran everything up. 
The Tea Party movement came in in 2010. We saw this incredible wave go across the country. But what Walker did in Act 10 and saying, OK, we're not going to have public sector collective bargaining again. Here's what we're going to do. Made that change. Yeah. That was that pivotal point that said, OK, local politics is important. Mm -hmm. And I think what it did is it started getting people realize that the power really is supposed to rest in the states. Tenth right. Amendment tells us that. And it's time for us to take that power back from D.C., and say, you know what? The states have the strength to do what they know is in the best interest of their people. Mm -hmm. That's how we work, and that's how we should continue to work. I think that's when it started. Um, it has continued to ramp up in 2016 when President Trump got in. He was starting to work on a lot of that, bringing the power back to the, to the states and removing it from the federal government. And I think that's what scared him and realized we're going to lose all our power if we can't get a lackey in there. And they got mm -hmm. one of the greatest lackeys. Of ever of all time in Biden. Oh, yeah. uh, Biden kind of reminds me of uh, I don't know if you remember Bernie from Weekend at Bernie's. Yes, that's just me. <laughs> I'm not trying to be low on that, but you know, some days you do wonder yeah. shaking hands with people who aren't there. Um, yeah, good times there, Weekend at Bernie's. But it is interesting because, yeah, like you mentioned, the Act Ten you had during the Tommy Thompson era, you had the uh, you know. Uh, welfare to work programs. And I, I look at the deep bench that we've had this cycle. Like you said, eight people running in lieutenant governor. We had two treasurer, three secretary of state, five gubernatorial candidates, um, three at one time, four AG candidates. Um, and I've been blessed to talk to most of them. And, and I look at this and I'm like, man, this is Wisconsin truly is a place yeah. for a conservative renaissance. I mean, this can take it to that next level. And I think that's almost evident by in our, in especially our, our position within the nation with the RNC, uh, you know, the convention being held here, 2024. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of a neat culmination. And I think I'm going to even go back down a little further. When you look at our state legislature, we've got some great conservative voices that are there mm -hmm. and working on behalf. And then in the spring cycles, I think we're going to see more and more of those conservative voices come out and say, you know what? Government is by the people for the people. It's not to tell the people what to do. Correct. We're seeing that in our schools. The parents are going back to say, you know, our kids are our responsibility. You're here to help us educate, but we're here to teach them how to be better people as they move through life. That's our responsibility. And I think when I took that whole picture and talked to the RNC and the site selection committee and told them, here's what we are and here's the purple state that we're in. Here's a beautiful gem that we have in Milwaukee most of the time that is by a great lake. Um, we would be wonderful hosts. And I will tell you to a T, they all said it. They said, this is an incredible group that you brought together. What a, really for me is amazing is we are actually bipartisan. When you think about Mayor Cavalier Johnson from Milwaukee is a big yes. Democrat. County Exec Crowley is a Democrat. But they know that this is good for their economy, good for their communities. The attention that it's going to bring, the ability to realize we can bring other organizations of this mm -hmm. size and host them in Milwaukee is going to be revenue down the road that we've never seen before. So to partner to get that done, that's easy for us to do because yeah. we know it's going to make Milwaukee and it's going to make Wisconsin successful. Well, and I've heard that, and this is just early estimates that Milwaukee is looking at a windfall of maybe $50 million easy uh, just from that convention. I mean, that's, yeah, that they did put a lot of hard work in there, putting the plans together and yeah, it'd be wrong to not acknowledge that for sure. Yeah. Um, again, I value your time and I really appreciate this. I want to close it out, but I want to let you have the last word. What are some things you want people to know about RPW, how we can get involved, um, just whatever you can get you offer? Because again, we want to make sure that people have a true understanding of what the Republican Party of Wisconsin is, stands for, and the vision to come. You know, I'll sum it up this way. The Republican Party is what you make of it you're responsible to get involved and get engaged. And that's at your county parties. Get involved, get out and knock doors, make phone calls, fold signs, create signs, help people out. 
but talk to your team, talk to the people in your community and say, okay, how can we make a difference? We build that strength at the county party and it works its way up. You know, one of the things I didn't say, talk about is kind of the executive committee of the Republican Party of Wisconsin. It's actually made up primarily of individuals from congressional districts. So when you think about it, we've got eight congressional districts across the state. We break up those individuals. So we have the chairman and first vice chair of each of those congressional districts is on the executive committee. That way itself up. And it is by far the majority. I mean, when you think four members of the executive committee, 16 of them come from the congressional district. Make sure we stay in touch with what's going on. And as I would say, and I talk to your candidates, question them, challenge them. And when you realize that they share the same across the finish line, that's how we're going to win this. You know, at the end of the day, in and thank everybody else that I've had conversations with on here. Um, just the ability to bring incredibly important because, again, it, it's easy to be off on the side, get mad. I don't know if people still do that or not, but um, only when the you are know, playing. Yeah. The TV one time, and uh, my dog looked at me like, What are you doing? I was like, yeah, okay. Give me a Important because again, it is what you make of it. It's it's easy to say, you know what? I just don't want to be a part of this. At the same time, if you're going to complain about what's happening, this is our opportunity to be paid. You know, Mom always told us, and rest her soul, she passed away in March. But you get to complain about government, and that's if you're engaged. If right. you don't vote, you don't get to complain get your voice heard once and then afterwards hold your elected officials accountable talk mm -hmm. to me i want to know what you're thinking what your thought process is on this and then i want to give you my so we're going to be victorious and i find a lot of the assemblymen and the senators to be very receptive to people I'm willing to hear what you got to say as you know again keep it courteous keep it respectful and yeah they're ready well, to help you out it is it and it's absolutely amazing can't thank you enough for that again i know your time is valuable and uh i'm hoping you know ed thank you for all you do and thank you for getting the message out there to everybody so that we have a different pathway right now so keep up the good work too thanks yep. a lot we got to create our own culture you know so however and that's what we're gonna do so again thank you sir have a great thank night you. chairman of the republican party of wisconsin i want to thank him for being on here tonight and you guys make social media but i will be releasing this here tomorrow night wednesday the 17th 8 p.m will be social media platforms do me a favor of course make sure you hit that subscribe it's a small thing I'm asking you, but it's a big deal, and it'll help us reach that magic number of 100. So good night, guys. I'll talk to you guys soon here. We got more conversations coming up. Scarlett Johnson will have her next week from Moms from Liberty. And then, of course, the Caramel Concerta podcast will be on tonight, the 16th. You'll miss it, but you'll get the replay. So check that out here tonight at 8. Good night. God bless you. God bless the great state of Wisconsin. And I'm out.